speaking now with John C. R Rusigay. Rusigay. John was a 19-year-old co-pilot on a B-24, and he is flying out of Italy on the, over to Munich. And what happened on the way? Well, we had a, a series of problems, including uh, electrical failure, amongst other things. And then we lost an engine as we were going with the group and decided to stay with the group. Instead of climbing to target, we stayed at altitude 15,000 feet all the way to target area and dropped our bombs over the target with the group. Then we lost another engine in a target area and came back on two engines. They were both out on one side, by the way. So we're flying. We lost all electrical power, by the way. So we had no radio communications. We had no power to the power turrets. We only had the through swinging free swinging 50 calibers in the waste engine, uh, waste uh, area of the back end. And uh, no communications, no electrical power for instruments. And with two engines out on one side, we were flying with one wing low, uh, obviously, that's the, with all the power on one side. And so we had nothing but airspeed indicator, altimeter, and uh, rate of climb. And, uh, and that was it. We, the compass wasn't even good because we were tilted at an angle. But we had some idea. We were flying over the Alps at 15,000 feet on the way back. Finally, the, fourth en the third engine went out just as we passed the coastline of uh, northern Italy there into the Adriatic. And that's when we had to swing back inland again. And uh, as we passed the coastline, we had people jump, jump out of the back end and the front end using hand signals as far as we're ready to jump. And we had five people depart from both ends. That way, uh, we were timed, fortunately, together, landed in a, co in a cohesive manner, if you will, such that I landed about 25 feet away from the last guy from the back end. And they got the partisans in the underground picked us up within uh, while we were unbuckling our chutes and got eight of us together within four hours, one guy the next day, and one fellow that's another experience by himself, the bombardier, a week later. and. Uh, we went with the partisans, walked eight hours every night over the mountains in the northern part of what was formerly Yugoslavia. Eventually, after four weeks, ended up in a village which was uh, under Allied control, if you will, in German behind the lines territory. And uh, they were holding back the enemy with uh, their underground people fighting the Germans, if you will, and, and local Quisling troops. But uh, we were there two weeks before we finally got an airplane that came in at night, a DC-3, C-47, if you will. Landed in a 2,000-foot strip in the valley, in the mountains, with nothing but smudge pots outlining the landing aid strip itself. That's the best airplane the U.S. ever made, I think, the C-47. And uh, after 40 days, we came back to Barry, Italy. The whole crew got out that way, and it was great. And within weeks, I found out later on, within weeks after we left, the area was overrun by the Germans, so we got out just in time, yeah. Well, that's interesting, John. What about uh, your uh, experience with the partisans? What was that like? It worked out great because, it basically, we had a language barrier, of course, and um, but it turned out that it was no problem because, basically, they just motioned to us to do whatever they did. We followed them on these trails over the mountains in single file. They had uh, one or two, three people in the front of us scouring to make sure it was clear. And then they had at least one or two people behind at the tail end of us so we would pick up any stragglers in our group of 10, if you will, while we were walking. And uh, they basically gave us, uh, we ate the same food they did, which was actually horrible. But it was not better than what they, you know, no worse than what they were eating. We're talking about eating soup made of uh, flour and water and some uh, fat from animals with no seasoning, wh whatever. Uh, sugar, salt were equally important, worth their weight in gold. That's you know, totally out of the question as far as any taste is concerned. But they shared everything they had with us, so it was not a question of them having more than what we had. And so we consequently uh, appreciated what they did for us, and they uh, took care of whatever injuries we had, et cetera, and uh, let us through all these areas. And we met after being down for about two weeks, we finally met an American intelligence officer from the OSS, which is currently the CIA. And he, in turn, uh, passed the information back to Italy that they basically had us under control behind the lines, though, but we would be returning, yes. 
It was a staging area we went up to eventually. They got about uh, maybe 50 people out of that area before they finally, uh, the Germans overran that area, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, that's quite a story. Uh, what do you think of the B-17? Well, I have nothing but the highest regard. Like I said before, they flew about four or 5,000 feet above us all the time. So that meant that they, have, they were less worried about flak than we were. And it was a more rugged airplane than a B-17. It was built tougher. And uh, I, I just envied those guys flying B-17s, frankly. <laughs> and the, more rugged than B-24. Yes, in addition to which, flying formation in a B-24 with those two rudders in the back, that meant that you were on those rudders continuously for formation flying close in, overlapping wingtips, that type of thing. And uh, when it was my turn to fly, we were 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off between the pilot and the co-pilot flying formation. And when it was my turn, you know, I was just one muscle from my toes direct to my shoulders without my rear end ever touching the seat. I was one muscle with the con throttles and the, and the yoke. It was I just... like driving a truck. It was worse than a truck. <laughs> <laughs> now, from your story, I understand that uh, one of the hottest pilots in the world was that B-40, that P, that's Charlie 47, the C-47 that went into the... G is that C-47 is a fantastic airplane. Yeah, I can't... I had the greatest respect for that airplane, yes, very much so. Well, thanks a lot for your story. You're quite welcome, I really sure. I really appreciate that, John. Amen. Anything you want to add? No, I think I've said it too much already. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, right. and trained a navigator in 1922 and you went overseas to where? Uh, Ireland first was well, replacement crew and Ireland at, uh, can't remember the name of the place in Ireland, waited. I was in the 322nd bomb group and the 449th bomb squadron and uh, they Are you taping? Okay, they were the ones that went the first low-level mission on the Mutant Holland and got shot up on the first mission and came back and they went on the second mission. Everybody shot down on the second mission. So we went from low level to 11, 10, 11, 12,000, depending on the target. And our, we didn't have oxygen. Sometimes we got up 13, 14,000 because of couch cover, but uh, came back a little woozy. <laughs> We didn't, uh, I shot down on my third night mission, so that was uh, interesting. <laughs> what happened then, Ken? I was a lead navigator on the G-Box, and uh, caught, I dropped my coastal indicator. We were in stream formation at night, you know how that is. And I was a lead navigator and dropped a coastal indicator, getting ready to go up pre-IP, dropped another indicator, then all the flak stopped. And what was the, your target? The, the, was the uh, home of the guys that were running the no balls, the flying bombs from the, you know, over to England. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were supposed to catch them at night. Oh, what they, they called us. Well, I think we lost 13 planes out of 36 that night. The V-1 rockets? No, 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 no. The but, but, the, that's the V-1's the one that goes way up in the air. Was the V-2 then? Well, the, the one that launched and, with, and then they had the putt-putt, you know, the flying bomb. Uh, we called them no-ball targets. Oh, yeah. there, it had a uh, ramjet. No, it was a pulse jet. Yeah. Yeah, it sounded like a motor. Yeah. But it was a jet engine. Yeah. Well, I, when I hit the ground, I know what it sounds like when they launch it. It sounds like a, a skyrocket going off. You know, the acceleration? And uh, I don't think it's 20 feet above me when I was on the hill there, but it's uh, once it gets up in the air, that it runs on that little. What do you mean 20 feet above you when you're on the hill? You were on the ground when they were like <laughs> Darn <up>. right. <laughs> we bailed out at night. Yes, well, sir. That's interesting. You bailed out over where, over what? Putty area, area between Amiens and Abbeville. And they were launching the... the sure. I saw lots I'm of... I'm talking too much. You tell the camera what you saw. <laughs> what I saw, I saw a rocket go out over my head. I, uh, we call them uh, 
be to uh, no ball target. Okay. Um, but uh, at night, and it was about 2.50 in the morning, 8th of July, and uh, so I waited until, oh, maybe uh, 5.30, 6 that night. It rained, thank goodness, because I had a rock there. I got my water. I'd bailed out. I hurt both, hurt both ankles. I couldn't walk. I crawled. And uh, at night, you don't know when you're going to hit. And that's a sudden stop. So, well, the reason to uh, get back to when we got hit, the pilot had rang the bell, get out. The bombardier came out of the nose. I was running that G box in the navigator section. I reached down for my chest pack. It wasn't there. So all of a sudden I said, Zardy, the bombardier, I said, I can't find my chest pack. He says, it's right over, he pointed to it. It's over behind the radio operators, you know, around the turret. So <laughs> that's funny because he sat down in my seat at that same instant, the pilot and the bombardier both got hit in the groin, just almost the groin area, and uh, came back. I tried to put a tourniquet over it, and a tourniquet is not that long to go around your thigh. I tried and I tried, and Zardy said, that's the bombardier, said, let's get out. So I opened the bomb bay door, and the planes went clear up to the cockpit. They closed the bomb bay door, and we went out the nose gear. Flames, you were on fire. Yeah, we were definitely on fire. Jesus. <laughs> and so uh, bailed out, naturally. And uh, as I was in the air coming down, I, I think we were six to eight, 10,000 feet. I don't know. It was, he was doing everything on the, that's the reason I lost my chest back. He was, that was the third night mission we'd been in search in searchlights so uh let's see train of thought anyway i while i was in the air i could see the plane blow up i thought oh oh never ever, i hope i got out you know that yeah. stuff junk mm -hmm. but everybody got out the co-pilot uh this, this is funny ken ken bales he shoes he has passed away was our co-pilot he refused to fly any more night missions, so Colonel Nye, who's our wing commander, Glenn C. Nye, real nice gentleman, he flew on several missions with us. Uh, he took our co-pilot and put it on Ken Bale's crew, and Ken Bale was our co-pilot. Mm -hmm. So Ken Bale walked into the in town there in the daytime, and of course the French couldn't, he was turned over to the Germans, you know, naturally. But I waited up on the hill until that night. Here come a boy, come along, and I uh, raised my hand. He saw who I was. I'd crawled down to the road, and uh, he pushed me over to the side. And he, I, I knew what he wanted. He wanted me to stay here. Here came his father and brother on bicycles later, and we got in and they got with the underground. And that was interesting. Well, when the underground picked you up, what happened then? They interviewed me, a Catholic priest. I thought his name was Mr. Curry, but I later understood that was the name of the, the what they called the priest. So uh, uh, he he could speak English. He's the only one that could speak English. And so they come pick me up, took me to another place on a bicycle, and uh, then uh, I stayed in the loft there for a day. And they took me to another place, and then Dr. John Carton. J E A N Carton. Uh, he looked looked after me from then on, and uh, I I really lucked out. I slept between sheets every night. I had the best meals. This butter merchant we lived with, he was a prince. I mean, we had pasted ration stamps in his books, you know, for the Germans. He had to put ration stamps in there, and he he would go out and get the best meals for us. Uh, when us. Uh, after about two weeks I was there, Eddie Blakely, a P-47 pilot on his first mission with rockets, got mm -hmm. shot down. And the first time I saw him, Dr. John was sewing up his forehead where he got hit the, the, the uh, well, or part of the plane cut his head. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky because Eddie Blakely had three years of college French. I didn't know anything. He was my interpreter from then on. Yeah, let's see, what else you want to know? Well, how did you get out? 
Oh, we stayed there. Uh, I'd say uh, we didn't, they told us not to get on the trains because trains were our targets, you know that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, in fact, I got my DFC by, by luck. We dropped in the oh, uh, police. They had a, trank, a train with, with tanks on it. Mm -hmm. And it was overcast and everything. We dropped down to 2,500 feet. And my bombardier got, got the train. <laughs> it's the first time my pilot ever flew, fired those fixed forward guns, you know, on the B-26. Yeah. And he had, a, he had a ball. I mean, he had a fun. And he, we, he, in fact, he made a 180 degrees turn and came right back around. So it was good. But anyway, luckily I DR'd him into the police and they gave me DFC for that. I don't know why, but did. Well, because you distinguished flying. But I didn't know the, the planes, the B-26s in Europe had the six machine guns up front. Six, four, two on each side. Four. Forward, okay. Forward. Yeah. Yeah, forward. yeah. Uh, Pilot controlled those. Yeah, 50 caliber. You no, know, they had those in the, in the Pacific, but I didn't know. But we, we did. We did. We had them all. Every plane. Every plane had it. Now you mentioned the G box. What is the G box? Oh, well, it's the same as Shoran. You know what Shoran was in in Korea? Two radio signals crossing. I see. And uh, G box. I could bring a guy right down the runway with the G box, yeah. and my pilot actually believed in me. But that was our way we got our targets, is uh, G-Box. And in fact, Pathfinders, I think, used something on the similar, mm -hmm. similar to that. And you'd drop your bombs from the, from the G-Box? We were going to, yes, we were. But never did, never did I drop them on G-Box. Yeah. But uh, I was the lead navigator. I was going to do it that night. Captain Robert Fry was shot down on that same mission. Mm -hmm. He was one that came back on the first low-level mission he lost an agent, came back low level, and uh, he got, uh, in fact, cop, Captain Robert Fry was in Abilene, Texas. He died. Uh, he was good. Karen, Colonel Nye was killed in Korea. Glenn C. Nye, he was, he was a prince. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> well, that's great, Ken. I appreciate that. One thing I'd like to add for the tape here is that uh, it was uh, Les Mulser who labored, later became a two-star general, the one that stopped the plane a day in Tampa Bay, or one a day in Tampa Bay. Well, how about uh, uh, Doolittle did, did too. Well, do, well, tell me about Doolittle. Doolittle, uh, Truman came down, and Doolittle took off with a single engine on a B-26. You know, I meant... You know, I got a book telling about all about. I know this from the book uh, Freeman wrote on B-26. Mm -hmm. uh, can't remember his name. Freeman is his last name. He wrote. He told about that in the book, and the uh, Doolittle actually saved the B-26. There's nothing that surprised me about Jimmy Doolittle. I talked with him about 30 minutes one time. I was absolutely enthralled about the guy. I've read everything I can find about him, and I'm still amazed at what he did with what he had. Mm -hmm. Well, Ken, thanks. You, for you won't believe this, too. but 63 years ago today, I was at Fort Sill. I was called up in the National Guard, Oklahoma, 45th Infantry Division. We were called up for one year. Yeah, sure. And we were stationed at Fort Sill for three months while they were finishing Camp Barkley at Abilene, Texas. Uh -huh. And uh, I was a staff sergeant. I was in charge of 10 ambulances and platoon. And uh, then we had Pearl Harbor. September 16th had already passed, so the guys with called up for one year had already gone home. So the guys that stayed in the 45th, got half of them went to Panama, the other half went to Philippines beyond that march. And uh, so then they had December the 7th. I didn't have a college education, but the, you have a text, you can pass the test. So I took the test and became a navigator. I bet you were a good one too. Well, I don't know about that. But I was in B-58s, my son counted the airplanes that I was in, hundred over 19 airplanes in 30 years. Golly. I've got 30 years from 1938 to 1968. That's something. I was in B-58s at Grissom Air Force Base, mm -hmm. and uh, B-29s in Korea, B-52s in Utapal, Thailand, and uh, that's about it. 
Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Well. This fair, good-looking gentleman that we have with us now is Warren Bud Loring, P-38 pilot of World War II. Bud, tell us about your experiences. Well, I'll try. It's been, uh, I'm just about uh, two and a half months away from being 80 years old. So uh, everything happened that back then is quite a few years ago. Um, I think that uh, I graduated from high school in 19... 42 in June. The war started in, uh, when the Japs hit Pearl Harbor. And uh, I was going to go into the Army Air Corps as a uh, aircraft mechanic and go to school. My dad says, well, why don't you uh, try for pilot training? I says, I, I, I don't think I can pass that. But uh, I passed the test and I was took the physical and I was put in the uh, program. I was sworn in on May 20th, 1942. And uh, after I got sworn in, I said, well, what happens now? They said, we don't have room for you. You go home and we'll send you a notice when to report. And this is up there in Massachusetts on Cape Cod. And it's uh, an army base at that time, Camp Edwards. And that's where I did all my testing there for the hospital and everything else. And uh, you had to pass a two-year equivalency uh, college test, which I passed, surprised me. And uh, I really didn't think I was going to make it, but I did. And I went into the cadet program. And it took us 10 days to come from Fort Devens all the way down to Santa Ana, California. And uh, we got into the cadet program down there. And here I am from the East Coast with all the snow, all the ice. I end up with pneumonia down there in Santa Ana, California, sunny California. So I started out with a class in 44, 43J, and then I got set back for a month, so because I was in the hospital, I went into 43K, and that's my class. And I graduated, I went to three different schools. From Santa Ana, I went to, up to uh, Varsalia, California for uh, primary in Lancaster for basic training in the BT-13 and on to uh, Williams Field in Phoenix, Arizona in Mesa. And we had the uh, AT-9s there and we had the AT-6s and we also had a, um, an RP-322, I think it is, was a restricted P-38. It looked like a P-38, it sounded like a P-38, but it didn't have the turbochargers or anything on it. They made 600 of them, and they shipped them to England, and England says, we don't like them, we don't want them, so they sent them back, and they put them in the training command. And that was one of the first P supposedly P-38s that I flew, when I was still a cadet. And I was 10 feet tall when I crawled into that thing and flew it for the first time. And uh, with very little instruction, we only had 10 hours in it. We had five hours, we had to sit in it and memorize all the instrumentation and so forth, and take a blindfold test to get in it. And we didn't have a jump seat in the back of a P-38, so you get a ride in it the first time. So when you were turned loose, you were still a twin engine pilot to start with. It wasn't too bad, but you realized that there was, it was quite a thrill flying that thing. And during our training out there, a big um, balloon came through, and I don't know, good rich or good year or whatever it was. And if you can imagine me, a young cadet, and I saw this balloon and I did a loop around it just to get their attention. And when I did that, that didn't seem to give them, so uh, this was from underneath of it and going around it. Then I went the long way, this way. That got their attention. Next thing I know, my radio says for the aircraft that was buzzing, the balloon stop immediately. And I gave my Roger, because he can't identify who I am and what I am. So I backed away from it.
But I fell in love with that aircraft and I uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, when I graduated, I left uh, Williams Field and I went to Massachusetts and I met a young gal back there. She was a sophomore in high school. She was 16 and I was 20. And I think she fell in love with my pinks and greens. So we got married and we were married for 47 years. She died from cancer. Can you cut it a second? Uh, we're saying that uh, so who wanted to be the first person to loop a hot air balloon? Yeah. Be in the hot air balloon. Yes. <laughs> but it's, uh, Whenever you're ready to start again, so okay. we will, but we understand That's, uh, where we're coming from. But uh, what I have done, I've <coughs> I had retired. Wait a second. Are we okay. back on again? I ret after I retired uh, from the Army, I stayed in the Army, by the way, and how I stayed in the Army and how I got into the Army, we started out in the Army because we had an Army Air Force. And when I got out of the Army in 1945, I went to the National Guard and I stayed with the, got into a National Guard unit back there. And uh, they wanted a permanent, a, ma a man permanent to take over a service center. And I was a uh, captain at that point, and they said, if anything should happen, you're called to active duty, we will take you from your master sergeant rank up to a captain again. And so when the Korean War came along, I decided that uh, I'd go see what the Air Force could offer me. And I was still a master sergeant at the time. And uh, I had the people uh, check my records, the Air Force over there, because it was Air Force now up there in Otis Air Force Base. And they looked at my records and they, the guy was all, all happy. I said, what can you do for me? He says, well, he says, we can have you on, call you to active duty in the Air Force and uh, we'll just switch branches from the Army to the Air, Air Force and we'll have you in Korea in 60 days flying P-51s. <laughs> I said, no, you won't. I says, hell no, I'm not going to take that. I says, is that the best you can do for me? He says, that's the best. And I says, well, thank you, but hell no, I'm not going to take it. So I went back to my job and worked there. A couple of months later, the unit was activated and I went on active duty in the Army. And while I was in the Army, uh, we couldn't talk. I want to go back a bit. We could not talk about anything that happened to us in the service, uh, in the underground, and French during being shot down during World War II. But I'd like to cover that before I get too far on, because I couldn't tell anybody about it, except that I was shot down. That was it. Nobody heard anything more about it. That was it. And uh, so I kept never joined any organization at all. I just stayed in the army and uh, went through and became a military officer. And because I went to a 105 outfit over in Germany during the Korean War, I decided that uh, I'd like field artillery and I would uh, enjoy being in it. So I went to the school down here at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, first as a motor officer, and when we called an active duty. And then the next time I was assigned as down here, as an instructor, I went to the Department of Motors in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And while I was there, I had a good boss, and uh, we got along very nice, and uh, I told him I'd like to go to the battery officers course so uh, I can find out what I'm doing in field artillery. And uh, he says, well, you're a captain now. He says, you, you should get the advanced course. And I said, I don't want to get the advanced course. I said, I want to get the battery officers course. I want to be just as good as, as I was in the Army Air Force, I, a good fighter pilot. And I said, I want to know everything about field artillery. So I went through the battery officers course, passed everything, came up to the advanced course then the next year, and passed everything, and got my prefix five, which is nuclear weapons, special weapons, and passed everything. I was the, uh, on my advanced course, so my captain rank I had at the time, I was the, about the senior captain, I guess, the United States Army. I've been 14 years in grade, and uh, 
we went up on a firing mission and the class leader was a major. They offered him a mission and he didn't want to take the mission. He didn't know anything about it. He was one of these that transferred branches and so forth. I'd already gone through the school, battery officer's course and the advanced course. And when they called on me, I just went out there and fired a mission. In three rounds, I had a target. And being a SA, as I said, uh, I turned around to my classmates and I said, gentlemen, that's how it's done. Three rounds and I had a target. Using the same attitude of life that we had as an Army Air Force pilot. Now to get back, and I stayed in the service and retired as a lieutenant colonel in the, in the artillery. But we, they decided that all artillery was going to be the same, field artillery and anti-aircraft. So they were all going to be the same. So after I finished up here in uh, Fort Sill, they sent me down there to uh, Fort Bliss, and I took over down there and went to Hawk Missile on the way to Korea. So when I come back, I was assigned to uh, Fort Bliss, and that's where I stayed until I retired. But now, we, going back and telling about what happened to me on 30 June 1944, uh, 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 it was uh, my fifth mission I was on, and just regressed it to just, just a little bit and talk about my second mission. Well, my first mission is the best one. Myself and a classmate, a Chinese boy named Yi Lit, and I were selected in the 55th Fighter Group to go up for an orientation flight. We had to borrow equipment because we didn't have any. We were brand new in the organization. But the aircraft we were flying were combat P-38s. They were always loaded and ready to go. So Captain Butkey was my flight leader, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Cogershell was the element leader. And the four of us took off, and no, no sooner took off than uh, we got a, a, Captain Butkey got a message over the radio saying that we had to go over to France and uh, pick up a crippled B-24. And I had not been psyched up for a mission as yet and it scared the hell out of me. I didn't know what to do, where to turn, everything. And even my parachute uh, harness didn't fit me. I had to borrow all this equipment. So we were just gonna go up and fly around for an hour or two and then drop down again. He was gonna see if we checked out for being a good combat pilot. And anyways, we got the first mission of our group that was in the new pilots, E. Litt and myself. The first mission, as I say, was over there probably about two hours. We picked the 24 up over front. I expected a German aircraft, an anti-aircraft fire everywhere I looked, every cloud. I, I was not psyched up at all. I didn't think about that going into combat just on an orientation flight. But anyways, we, I got that successfully behind me and I kept thinking all the way back. You were an escorting a B-24 from France. Crippled out of France back to England. And uh, what I did on that one there, I, it bothered me so much when I come back, I was thinking about it, and we come in for a landing, we come in echelon to the right, and we'd normally supposed to come in 50, uh, 500 feet, but fighter pilots put it, come in about 50 feet, and they shondell up off. And as we shondelled up there, and I was the second man to shondell up and follow the flight leader, I thought to myself, there must be something good that will come out of this mission. Now, what is it? What is it? There's got to be something. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me as I'm going up like this here with the P-38. I can have fresh eggs. I'm on combat status now. <laughs> now, that was what you could think about. You put your life in jeopardy, and all of a sudden, all you're thinking is there's got to be something good. That was the good thing. If you've never eaten powdered eggs, forget it. They were horrible. But having fresh eggs was the thing. And from that time on, we had fresh eggs. And uh, my second, <laughs> so I got my first mission out of the way. Then my second mission, uh, uh, I lost an engine. And I had to come home on a single engine from a deal. And we had another cripple bomber coming out. So they sent our flight out to escort him home. 
And uh, if you've never flown a P-38 on a single engine, uh, three or 400 miles, you can understand that. It's, uh, if you don't change your speed, or air speed at all and so forth, it's very easy to handle. But if you start letting down, if you've got to reach down here and crank the trim tabs and so forth, and you've got to watch the throttle back and forth and try to stay in formation. And my flight leader asked me if I wanted to go over and uh, with this other cripple, and I said, no, he's bait. And all they're doing is waiting to shoot him down. I don't want to be there because I have to turn my aircraft right into the whoever's coming in. I can shoot at him, but I got to turn into him. I said, no, I'll stay right here and follow you down. So we went down through and landed, and everything was all right. But on my last mission, on the fifth mission on 30 June, I had this uh, strafing mission, and uh, uh, I was strafing about 50 feet, and I got hit and uh, on the deck, and I had to start a fire, small fire, and I shut the engine down and feathered the prop up and everything else and did everything I was supposed to do to it. Couldn't put the fire out. We didn't have a fire extinguisher or a system in the aircraft. And the engine and the fire kept going and it kept going and it kept going and I couldn't see what I was doing. And I was all over the sky, I know I was. But I had to get up from an altitude because I knew that eventually I was gonna to have to bail out if I didn't make it. And I stayed with it too long. I stayed with it long enough for the engine to fall off, the right engine to fall off, the wing fell off, the tail boom fell off, and I fell out of it. And when I fell out of it, uh, I went across a lot of wing surface, and I only had one wing left, and that was the left one, so I must have gone down the wing or something. And I fell off, and I saw, to, before I pulled my chute, my D-ring there, I looked and saw the aircraft going away from me and what was left of it. And uh, then I pulled my D-ring, my D and just as I did, I said, God, I'd like to have that for my mantle if I survive. <laughs> but it was too late, it's gone. And if you haven't parachuted out of an aircraft, uh, it, to me, it was a necessary evil to have that chute there. I would like to try using a parachute before this, but uh, it never come about for me to do it. And we didn't send pilots up to practice this at all. A parachute was just something you sat on, something you used to lay your head on when you were out there in the dry lakes or this sort of stuff. So it, uh, it was quite an interesting deal about this parachute. But anyways, it opened up. You think nothing of it, it is going to open. And here I am, 20-year-old kid, just out of high school, and heading down to France, not knowing anywhere where I was. I have no idea where I was. And I landed south of the uh, Loire River, and uh, down just the other side of uh, Bourges, France. And uh, when I landed, I was burnt quite badly. My, my, I was burnt from my chest on up. I had no hair, no eyelashes, no eyebrows, no ha hair in my ears, anything. I had nothing on me. It was nothing but blisters all the way. Um, well, I had a medical kit on the parachute there that I took with me. They had morphine in it. And uh, when I landed, I sprained both ankles. My hands were burnt and so forth. And the French people helped me right away. They come right there and help me. And I tried to convince them that I uh, would like a glass of water. And uh, of course, you can't. Talk. I don't talk French, and I didn't take any French in school. And I've kicked my butt for never taking the course. I would have loved to have been able to talk to those people. But anyway, see, they helped me, and uh, I uh, asked for water. And uh, they finally brought me wine. I didn't want wine. I wanted water and water and water. I was so thirsty. And they finally brought me a glass of wine. And I put it up and drank it. I was so thirsty. When I took the wine glass away, there's my lips still on the, on the glass. Yeah, burning. I was burnt badly. Yeah. And, uh, then I asked them if they would give me a mirror, because I kept putting my hands up so I could see my face. I didn't know whether I was going to die or what I was going to do. And they finally uh, said, no, they weren't going to do that. They were going to give me a mirror. So then they had to get me out of the area, so with my 
bad ankles and my burns and so forth, they put, took me over to a uh, hedgerow, probably a quarter of a mile, a half mile away, and put me in a hedgerow. And I sat in that hedgerow all night, and I had the uh, 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 medical kit I had there. I had some, um, gave myself a couple of shots, uh, but you're only supposed to use it to give yourself one shot. And I know one shot isn't going to do it. I need to give myself a little bit every bit and so forth. And there was no alcohol, no nothing to rub you. You just yeah. shot in your arm and did it and so forth. And of course, with all the pain you're in, it didn't hurt a bit. And I stayed in that hedgerow for about three or four days. They finally brought me wine. They finally brought me bread. And that's about all that I had to eat during this time. Um, but uh, I didn't know what was going on, and I decided that I would stand, I would get in this hedgerow, and I'd move so I could see the 90 degree angle this way and 90 degree angle that way, and I was at the corner. And the only thing in that hedgerow that was alive was myself and all the varmints that were running around. And there must have been rats and squirrels and you name it. You could hear everything going on at night when it was dark. And I stayed there for about a week, and they finally decided to get me to my first house. They took me in. And I guess it was about three weeks before I saw a doctor, and I think the doctor gave me a shot of tetanus in my leg, and my eyes had to be bathed open every day. When I went to bed, I went to bed, and my eyes stayed there. They dried out. And uh, this hand was so bad, it throbbed, and I had to keep this hand up like this here. And I tell everybody uh, my mode of transportation was walking, but with the sore ankles and so forth, I couldn't walk very much. So we decided to have to get some bicycles. So we stole some bicycles, and I tell everybody in my talk that I talk to different people on it, if you're going to steal a bicycle from somebody, don't steal it from a handicapped person. Because if you do, it may be something that you're going to regret. And I regretted the fact that I stole this one from this old man. And I was a 20-year kid, 20-year-old kid. I stole this bicycle, and he had problems with his left leg. And he had another universal joint down in there, so this leg never went anywhere but back forward. But you couldn't pedal with it. So you're pedaling actually with your right leg. That's all you're doing. So I never knew while I was traveling from place to place where I was going, I never knew where I'd been, and I didn't know anybody. But I, they had gave me this guide, and we started off traveling. And I thought they were going to take me over the Pyrenees, but they said with my bad ankles and so forth, they thought I thought they were going to take me down someplace on the coast and run me around by boat. That's what they were talking about. But that never became, and then, of course, the Patton has made all these big drives up there in Normandy uh, after the, the first of June, so everything was starting to break open. And uh, they decided to move me up to a forest, and I didn't know it was a forest, but anyways, we were pedaling on the stolen bicycle. And we went by, first thing that ever happened, yeah, look, we trying to keep these in order. I did, uh, let's see, we were traveling with a stolen bicycle and we were heading into this village. And just before we got into the village, a black Mercedes comes out of the village with the Gestapo and the police and everybody else and the owner of the bicycle. And this is about four or five days after we'd stolen the bicycle. So they must have been looking all over for me. And I did some dumb things. I tied my escape kit on the back of the bicycle. And in plain sight, somebody, anybody could have seen it. But nobody paid any attention to it. But they were talking, they were hollering and everything. And I uh, taken my escape kit off the back of the bike and stuck it in my coat pocket. And then I picked the bicycle up and threw it at the four of them. <laughs> and then I ran like hell. And I expected to be shot. My guide went right into the village. Right, the first thing he saw, he was going like mad because he had too, a good bike. 
And I thought, I'm gonna, this is gonna be it. They're gonna shoot me, they're gonna shoot me. They never shot right at me, and nobody followed me. And as I went through this little small village, I got out of the village and I went into the woods to the right. And I've never run so fast and so hard in my life. My heart was pumping. And I crawled into these very thick woods and sat there and was, didn't know what I was gonna do. I think I sat there probably about four hours because I don't know what I was gonna do. I had $5,000 of French money that they had given me. My guide has $5,000. So we had all the money but no place to spend it. And uh, I couldn't, didn't know what I was gonna do. And little lo and behold, my guide had a lot more sense than I did because he had gone to the left. And he watched me go into the woods. So he waited till the police disappeared. And then he come into the woods and I heard some noise. And I pushed some bushes apart and looked at him. And he was a tall guy. And I'm 5'10". He was tall. He was about 6'2". I looked out and I saw him. God, was I so happy to see him. I, I just fell apart. I ran out of the woods and hugged him. <laughs> and uh, he hugged me. He was glad to see me. And so now we have to go steal another bicycle. <laughs> yeah. So I stole another bicycle. And this one was fine. And... Uh, no problem, but I made sure this one had both pedals working. And we got up to the Loire River, and there's a bridge going across. It's a checkpoint. But we're not 50 feet from that bridge. We go down to the Loire River. We take our bikes and go into the house. We go out of the house, come out with our bikes, and put our bikes in a boat and row across the river up into the woods. Now there's a very suspicious looking thing going on when you've got a you can walk right down this road nobody ever looked over the side I thought we were going to get shot but, but right after that happened uh, we're going someplace some between the Loire River and going north uh, four P-47s decided they were going to strafe a marshalling yard we're right uh, right oh, side of it uh, I've got a lot of guts, but I couldn't get under those cobblestones no matter how I tried. I was laying down, and they were using it just like a gunnery back here in the States with nobody shooting at them. Uh, there were uh, 850 caliber machine guns in those P-47s, and they just, just flying around one after the other come down and hit this marshalling yard. They had that thing on fire and going, and I thought I was going too. but. Uh, we, we, survived, we survived that. We went over 100 yards from the, the marshalling yard going by it. And uh, I can't do anything out in public like anybody else, even my guy there. I have to eat away from other people, the French people, because I can't eat like a French person. I can't smoke a cigarette like a French person. I can't even go to the bathroom like a Frenchman. And that's uh, it's a dead giveaway. But because um, I was burnt, I was uncleaned as far as the Germans were concerned. They didn't want to be around anybody like that. I was sick. There was nothing, they wanted nothing to do with me. And finally we got, after about, uh, oh, six to eight weeks, I finally got to a forest. And I have been back since. And there were 159 people in this forest. And uh, because of the, the Americans and their allies, sometimes we've got nothing else to do, we needle each other. And so they've decided to have a second camp in this forest. It's 40 square miles of woods. And on the northeast corner, was, they put the allies personnel. And on the southwest area in the woods was the Americans. And in between us is a German ammunition dump if you could imagine such a thing. Never strafed, nobody ever bombed it, and that's where they live. And uh, this gal, I'm trying to think of what her name was uh, now, mm, can't even think of it, but uh, she set it up with her husband, Albert D. Lake, and uh, they set up this camp. She was captured by the Germans in July, and this is in September. If she had talked, Everybody in that camp would have been dead. But we didn't know this at the time. 
but she didn't talk. And she survived Ravensbrook and come back to her husband. Now, she was a gal that was born in Dayton, Ohio, and brought up in, uh, down there in St. Petersburg, Florida. And she went through grade school, high school, and college. In 1935, I think she went to uh, France, and she met this Albert D. Lake, and she married him. And she was over there during the entire war. And she has since passed away, and uh, so has her husband. But uh, they have quite a wreckage. Now, my Navy buddy of mine told me in 1979 when he came back from Pensacola that you ought to go to the reunion. You meet somebody, you meet a lot of people, and it's great. I said, well, I don't know anybody when I get down, if I go to a reunion. I went to an 8th Air Force reunion in Orlando, Florida. I met 35 people that I was in the forest with or the help the helpers and so forth. And one of them was Virginia DeLake. That's her name, Virginia DeLake and Albert DeLake. And they were quite a well-off family over there. He was quite wealthy. The D-E-L-A-K-E? I think it is. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, I couldn't get over uh, meeting her. I just couldn't believe it. And then to meet some of the people that were in the forest with me. And when I, they took me to this forest, the first thing they asked me was, what type of aircraft did you fly? I said, a P-38. And they said, oh, we got a P-38 pilot here. And uh, he come up and he introduced me to them, and uh, they did. And we shook hands, and I said, well, where are you from? And he says, I'm from the 55th Fighter Group. And I said, well, so am I. And he says, I'm from the I says, what squadron? He says, the 343rd. I says, that's my squadron. And I says, who was your flight leader? He says, Captain Butkey. I says, Captain Butkey is my flight leader. First I thought, first thing came to my mind, I've never seen this guy before in my life. Then it dawned on me what I was doing. I was his replacement. So it all come down to one big thing, thinking this out and so forth. He didn't believe me because he'd never seen me. And he didn't know whether I was a, a fake person thrown into the system to find out. And he felt, I felt the same thing. Then it dawned on me why I didn't meet him. And I said, when did you get shot down? He told me. And I said, I'm your replacement. So when we went back to England, we went to the 55th Fighting Group, both of us did, and wished our replacement a hell of a lot better luck than we had. And uh, I think that uh, I've... As I say, I've been over to Europe four or five times since then, met all these people, been back to my uh, airfield that I took off in Wormingford, and uh, if you got any questions and so forth, I'd be most happy to answer them. I don't have any questions, but I, I do want to thank you, thank you for one great briefing. You covered all the waterfront, and you, every time time I thought about asking you a question, I held my mouth closed, and you answered it before I got a chance to do it. Bud Loring, thank you so much. Okay. Yes. My question is, how did you join the Athes? When, I mean, when, were, when did you join the Athes? In 1980. It was my first time with Athes. And, uh, I didn't think I'd meet anybody down there that I knew. And as I say, I was, I was just shook when I met all these people. Who told you about APs? Uh, I, I think somebody sent me some paperwork. Well, I know they sent me paperwork while I was in the service afterward. Back in, they started forming it in 64, um, 65, mm -hmm. someplace in New York. Um, I think uh, Buffalo, mm -hmm. I think it was. And I had heard about it, but I was still in the service, and I was going back and forth. I'd been everywhere in the service you can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. I'd been to Iran, I'd been to Korea, I'd been to uh, uh, Germany, and so forth. So I've had quite a varied traveling. And one other thing, since I left there, service in 1968, with 26 years, I went back to Massachusetts and uh, went to work, and I uh, worked for the uh, gas company back there and worked for them for 19 years and I finally uh, retired in 
1987 or 88, I guess it was 88 I retired. Well, you escaped and evaded and... Done all these things. Yeah. And you got back to England, how? Oh, we would, uh, they flew us back. You know, we, all, we stayed away from a, trying to stay away from a POW camp. Yeah. We didn't want that. But where did we end up? And it's amazing because we were in a, the Red Ball Express, if you've ever heard about it. Oh, yeah. Okay, the Red Ball Express picked us up, black drivers, mm -hmm. and they took us back through the front lines. And uh, when they transferred us from the uh, Captain Whalen's recon outfit that picked us up, and they took us part way back, and then the Red Ball Express picked us up. And we were all in civilian clothes, we were mangy looking. And I'll never forget this military policeman, black, looks up at the truck, because we had no canvas on the deuce and a half. He looks up at the truck, and he looks at us, and he says, the gates. And he thought we were German. Mm -hmm. So we came right back, the gates my ass, we're Americans. Mm -hmm. And this shook him all up. Then you saw him with this great big smile, because only an American can talk like this, and so forth. And he says, well, everything's off limits. And then he looked at us again, and he says, I never saw you. Go in there. Get what you want. I still had some of that money left, so I went in and bought booze for everybody. I had $5,000. Yeah. And I used that for starting uh, fires in the woods and so forth, cooking and anything like that, because I thought it was just fake money. <laughs> when I got back to England, they asked me if I had any of this money on me. And I says, yeah. So I have a couple hundred dollars back. They said, if you turn it in, we'll, we'll put it in greenbacks for you. I said, I'll be damned. And I knew it was dropped by that. Lighten your money with, yeah. lighten your fire with $20 yeah. bills. But everything that I had in the unit was shipped out, so I couldn't get civilian clothes or nothing. I had no military uniforms, no nothing. So when I come back, they had to go all the way up to Eisenhower, because uh, we already do a high uh, a uniform allowance when we first come on active duty. And uh, so, we didn't have nothing. Nothing was around. Nothing, no, every unit was already shipped the stuff out. If you've been gone 30 days, it's gone. It's back to quartermaster on the way back home. So we were authorized one uniform. We finally got the government paid for us for a new uniform. We walked in in there in our old rags and so forth, and uh, we got a complete set of pinks and greens, socks and everything. One set, all this, anything else you want. They gave us pay so that we could get paid and have some money. And we had to be interrogated by everybody over in England. And, and back, we got back to the States. We were interrogated again over here in the States. And Virginia, we got hit with going out to some of these o o OSS places and CIA places and so forth. And they would come around to the swimming pools and talk to us or at the bar and talk to us and try to get all the information they could. And um, then I was told that I. I could not talk about anything, and it was classified information, and if I did, I would probably get my butt in a jam, and it could hurt the people that helped me. So that was the reason why we didn't talk about it to anybody. Did you have to sign a paper saying yes. that you wouldn't? Yeah, that's right. You signed a paper that you wouldn't talk about your that, escape and evasion? That's right. For 50 years, or well, we got it in 19, sometime in the late 70s. We got, we were allowed to start talking about it, but I didn't pay any attention to this because I hadn't talked about it to anybody, so I didn't talk to anybody about it. I've had people in the service that were my boss never question me in the army why I'm wearing an eight-day force patch and why I'm wearing pilot wings, mm -hmm. and they didn't find this out until after I retired from the service. And I went to some of these places. I went down to uh, Memphis, and I went down to see this colonel <coughs> that was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, my boss. And he says, to, what are you down here for? I says, well, we were down in the area. And I says, I says, whether you knew it or not, I says, I was shot down during World War II. He says, I didn't know that. I said, I didn't know we're not supposed to tell you anybody. And so I was his assistant there for quite a while. And he never knew it. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever questioned me, wanted to know why. And it was classified and... Uh, well, you didn't want to hurt anybody that's still over no, there? No, you don't. Could be, could 
Now I'm dealing with the grandson now, as one of my helpers. Mm -hmm. It was the Pollard family that helped me. And while I was in Germany in 52 to 55, I made a point to go over to France, drove over there, and we took, I took two other officers from our group and their wives, so we had six of us American, three men and three officers and three, and three wives. We drove over there and went back to the place where I was shot down. They knew we were coming, because we wrote to them, and you get all of these letters in French, and you can't understand them. You don't know what's in it, so you go to the local high school, the French teacher, and you get a, a reading on it, and she'll give you a paper, she'll type up a, what they said in there. Then you take the same paper and give it to somebody else, and they'll get something else out of it. Mm -hmm. So you have to pick it out and see what you've got and so forth. So, and I know one of my guides wrote sometime in '46 wrote to me, and I wanted to know if I made it home. And uh, but she he didn't give me his address to, to write back. And of course, I would have taken it up after I wrote out what I wanted to say. I'd have the French people teach her write it out for me, or type it out, and I'd send it back to them. But uh, when we met them the first time in 54, I think it was, uh, it's just unbelievable. Uh, there were six of us Americans sitting in this guy's uh, bar, restaurant type thing there. And this little girl now was a 20-year-old girl, beautiful looking girl and her brother and so forth and uh, we had a good time with him and uh, he brought this the uh, guy that was he was a lieutenant also in this underground he brought out some wine a bottle of wine he gave to my wife and said uh, this is very very good wine it's been sa aging for years and so forth then he gives me a bottle and he tells me your bottle isn't as good as hers mm -hmm. she's got the best <laughs> So they were very nice to me. Okay. But you go from family to family to family. You, don't, you can't go back and, unless they come forward and tell you. There's no way you can find out. And You didn't want to know their names? They didn't want to know you? They don't, they don't want to know nothing. <laughs> and uh, that, that was very difficult to track it down after the war. It's still difficult. Yes. Um, we're still trying to find out. I just met a late, little lady last week at a grammar school reunion. There's a French lady that was part of the underground, mm -hmm. and I'm going to get her a member of Safe Peace. Yes, because. Now we're speaking now with Howard DeMalley. Right. He's a B-17 pilot at age 22, flying over in Europe. You left England from what base and what happened after that? Well, I was at the 447th Bomb Group, and uh, we flew to England to bomb Merseburg, which is a uh, uh, oil refinery city uh, somewhere near Berlin. And um, it was always known for a lot of flack. And uh, I took off, and uh, they asked me. Uh, I was flying as a as a fill-in on that particular mission, and when I took over a, a, a plane spot that returned to our base in England because of bad trouble or something, and uh, it was a low, low spot in the formation, which is not a good spot. Anyway, we flew over Merseburg, and it's very, very heavy with flak, lots of flak. It's like a solid cloud of black flak going up. And uh, we took a flak, two of them really, one went through our wing and took out my right uh, gasoline tank, which flooded the, the ball turret in the plane, which is down under here, and uh, got the ball turret out of there, ball turret gunner. And uh, then we took out, it also took out another engine. So I had one engine running out because it didn't have any fuel, another one that was damaged with the flak. And uh, I tried to keep up with the, with the, 
uh, formation and squadron. And uh, we did all right for just a little while, but the plane just uh, was slowing down. And so we uh, had to go off by ourselves. And um, we headed back towards England. What I was trying to do was get back to uh, our regular in our territory. You know? And uh, we came over Holland. I want to head back towards Holland. There was no flak in that particular area. Anyway, the, uh, the two engines wasn't doing too well. They were left. And uh, one had an oil leak in it. So we started throwing out everything we had in the, in the plane to get it so it wouldn't lose altitude. And we did dump everything. We dropped the ball turret. We threw all our guns out, the radios, and everything that wasn't nailed down. We threw out that plane. We were still going downhill all the way. And um, we kept going until we were over Holland, and we were about 1,500 feet off the ground. And uh, it was cloudy and overcast. I couldn't see the ground. And then I had to bail the crew out. And so we all jumped out. My uh, tail gunner went out first, and the rest of the crew went out uh, uh, in, in the waste gun position. And my uh, navigator and uh, bombardier uh, went out through the little navigation hole in the, in the front of the ship up in here. And, uh, and then my uh, co-pilot and I, we went out through the bound door, the bound bay. We had already dropped our bombs. So we, this, we, the flak hit us after we had got rid of our load. So anyway, uh, we came down, we went through the, I came down, I went through the overcast and, and we were over a lot of you know, flooded fields and I saw, uh, uh, gangs of people looking at, up at us, and uh, I saw the plane going down underneath the clouds, and uh, and then uh, I landed in water, water up to my waist with the flooded fields, and uh, and so there I was, and I saw the crowd of people. I didn't know what they were, Germans or or just Dutch people, off to the right, and I took off, and I ran the best I could through this slushy stuff and, and headed towards woods and what have you. And uh, eventually I, I, I got on better ground, but between all the uh, farm areas, they had trenches and they were filled with water and, uh, and this flooded field and, and brush. And uh, so I ran out of steam and uh, eventually I had to lay in one of them and watch what was coming on. And I saw some kids uh, off in the distance, young kids. And uh, they, they saw me too, and they came towards me, and I thought, well, geez, I gotta, give, I gotta get some help from someplace, and I thought this might be a good deal. So I, I uh, waved at them, and they came over. And, uh, and they couldn't speak English, but one of them enough to say, come with us, and, and Germans were over there or something like that. And so I went with them, and they uh, guided me up into the woods. And uh, uh, let's see, they asked me to lay in a trench for a while that was along in the woods, and then I did, and uh, I couldn't understand what they're talking about. There's about a half a dozen kids. And anyway, eventually, uh, uh, two girls arrived on a bicycle older girls. They were late 20s or something like that. And uh, they had brought clothes for me. And uh, so I, through sign language and everything else, we got our, my clothes changed from what I had on uh, to uh, Dutch clothes. And I, the boys uh, heard at me along through the woods, and, uh, and then they stopped at a certain place. And, you know, it was getting close to dark by then, and uh, this was in the afternoon. And uh, then they uh, they all took off except two, and then uh, they were brothers, I found out later, and uh, uh, the older one uh, stayed with me and the younger one took off. And uh, the older one couldn't speak English, but he just says, just, just wait. And, uh, 
pretty soon the younger one came back, and uh, then they, we both, all three of us, started off for, uh, for the town of Stophurst. I didn't know that, but uh, that's where we ended up. And the Stoppers is a, uh, a very small town. Uh, uh, the people dressed very peculiarly. Uh, it's a very religious town, and but uh, that they found out later. All uh, the women dressed it in, in long clothes and funny hats and things like that. Anyway, these uh, two boys took me to their home, which is a, a farmhouse, and. Uh, this was after dark now, and uh, we we were careful. We went along the street, and they would one would go out and wave the other on, and the two of us would join them, and then we'd go like that until we got to his house. Then we went through the um, the barn, which was attached to the house, and uh, and I got into the house. Now then, this is by the way, this is. Uh, December '44, and it was a miserably cold winter in Holland. And later, I found out it was the coldest winter they've had in years. But anyway, uh, I got in there, and there was a uh, potbelly stove with a whole bunch of little kids sitting around it, and, and I sat down with, like the rest of them, and, uh, warm up, and uh, and uh, the elderly woman, uh, probably the grandmother of the bunch, she, she gave me something to drink. And anyway, I'm kind of dozing off there, and all of a sudden, I did doze off. I heard somebody, is this the American pilot? And my gosh, I woke up like that, and here's uh, a rather attractive girl standing there. And uh, so that's, she was from the Dutch underground. And so that uh, got me together with the underground. Now, I can go on and give you a long story, but anyway, um, eventually, I was uh, taken to a house in Stophurst. And this was a house that was, I didn't know this at the time, but his, uh, the owner was the chief of police of Stophurst. And so they hid me up in the attic. And they had a nice, big, nice soft bed up there. It was beautiful. And uh, I was there uh, for a couple of days. And, uh, and the people that would constantly come in and I'd hide up in the attic. Otherwise, I'd be downstairs with the whatnot. But this, uh, this policeman uh, showed me a wallet that he'd gotten from one of my people, one of my crew members. Shoot did not open. It turned out to be my bombardiers. And um, I didn't know that, but I had his wallet, and there's nothing in it, but uh, we're not, we weren't supposed to carry any identification around. And, yeah, but he had one receipt in there from something, and uh, it was dated his hometown. I, was, I knew the town, so I knew it was my bombardier. Well, anyway, uh, he was killed. The chute did not open. And the rest of the group, uh, now I found this out later, all were landed in a, a city of Stophurst or another town. I don't know. I'm not sure where, but they were picked up immediately, except for my tail gunner. He went out of my ship first, and he got away with the help of the Dutch. And uh, I was at this, this uh, uh, chief of police's home, and um, uh, Peter Vandenhoek, who was heading up the Dutch underground in that particular area, came over and saw me. And uh, he said, he will take care of me now. And I didn't, I was, I'm really pleased. I didn't have to worry about myself anymore. I had the Dutch underground going to help me. And um, Peter said, I, I might be able to bring your uh, tail gunner over. And he did, the next day or so. And uh, his name was Lowell Bishop. And uh, he had a very, very badly sprained leg. But uh, he joined us there, and we stayed in this house for a while. And then, to make a long story short, we managed to get move on to Meppel which is a rather large city, relatively speaking. We did this with a bicycle trek, trek and uh, with the help of uh, uh, Peter's fiance, Mimi, uh, who was, was the woman who saw me first and got me started, and, uh, and uh, another 
young girl who was a courier for the underground. And uh, we rode bicycles uh, in a very peculiar fashion. Um, Lowell, my tail gunner, couldn't ride, he couldn't pump, so he was being, uh, he was on the back seat of uh, one, uh, and they were pumping for him, and I was on a bicycle, and Peter was on a bicycle, and Mimi was on a bicycle. <laughs> and, but eventually, we ended up in Bethel, and we went through a, a very, very massive group of police, or not police, but German soldiers. I didn't realize why there were so many German soldiers there until later. I realized it was the buildup for the Battle of the Bulge. And um, we went through Meppel on bicycles and got to a house where we uh, stayed, a safe house. And uh, the lady who ran the house uh, had a daughter and a son, young daughter and young son. And uh, we called her the Mrs. because we could not pronounce her name. We were there for uh, a while, and uh, and then one night, um, the day before Christmas Eve, all of a sudden somebody's pounding on the door, and uh, uh, like you expect the Germans to pound on the door, and uh, we all ran upstairs and hid under the bed and in the closet. I got into a closet, and they came in, and uh, it was the German. Uh, Gestapo, SS troops, and uh, they shot the woman whose home we were in, and uh, then they got Paul and Peter under the bed, and my tail gunner and I in a closet, and maybe, uh, anyway, they, they got us, and they took us to the uh, SS headquarters, and uh, there they did an awful lot of interrogating of Peter and Mimi. And, um, and some of, of us, but not very much. Uh, by, uh, I gotta say this, by then we had transferred to German clothing, or not German clothing, Dutch clothing. We had been given Dutch passports, we had Dutch papers, and uh, they were trying to teach us what to say if people asked us questions. And uh, but anyway, it didn't do a darn bit of good, <laughs> except that they, <laughs> they captured us and we, um, and uh, it was Christmas Eve, and they were beating the dickens out of uh, Peter in the next room that we were hiding, uh, not hiding, but staying in. They could hear him pounding him against the wall and whatnot. And the next time I saw him, he was just a bloody mess you would never believe. And Mimi was beat up, too. But they did not do us anything. Uh, um, my tail gunner and I. I gotta tell you one other thing. Uh, we had been without changing our clothes for a long, long time. And the missus who ran the house said, it's time to get you guys cleaned up. So she took our underwear, which they gave, we had been wearing long johns, which <laughs> felt pretty good to having nothing, and uh, our socks. And so we had on cotton shirts and a pair of pants and our shoes. And that's what we were captured in. And uh, it was weeks before I got any clothes other than that. And uh, uh, eventually I ended up in another jail and eventually Tail Gunner and I were taken to a, a camp. I don't know really what it was. It was after dark when we got there, but it was, um, they put us in a, uh, an underground, individually into an underground uh, cell, so to speak. It was just a a hole in the ground, a little window of about a five by four by five inches up in the ceiling. It had a uh, one flat board for a bed that was just wide enough to lay on. Pitch dark, it, and a muddy, muddy floor, and it was just freezing cold. And uh, they put us in separate, uh, whatever you want to call those. And they were there for, gosh, no, I don't know how long. You can't, I lost my feeling for time after a while, just, just freezing. And uh, Christmas Eve, I know, they threw in a, a um, my first meal in some time, they threw in a, um, a hunk of bread, the back end of a piece of a loaf of bread that was on the floor, and I 
fell around in the dark to find it, and there was rats in there too. And I got it, and I, I had a spit on it so I could get it eaten. It was so hard. That was my Christmas dinner. And I don't know, it went on and on and on, and eventually I got out of there, and they moved me and both of us to another um, place in Germany. And uh, we were there for a while, and then uh, we had some excitement in that, too. Uh, that, uh, they didn't, well, the only thing they did to me, <laughs> they interrogated me. And, uh, and then they took me back up into the upper room where all the, there was a whole bunch of guys there that I found out were from the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, they were Canadians and uh, English and one Norwegian. They were all, uh, one was a glider pilot, and the other ones were, they just been captured. And they, uh, they took me up and after my interrogation, and uh, they only whacked me once, that wasn't so bad. But I got up there, there was a post. My God, they tied me to it, and uh, they had a machine gun that they had set up in front of it. I thought, oh my God, oh my. And then the fellow, the leader, the, I don't know what kind of officer he was, he started to laugh. He says, you're too stupid to be, be a, 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 whatever you want to call me. And uh, so he untied me, and I went back and uh, laid down on my bed, and uh, boy, it felt good. After that, uh, they moved us eventually to, uh, uh, not Stalag Luf 1, but uh, Dulag Luf, which is where they uh, interrogated uh, pilots and airmen. And I was there in a cell for a while. And then uh, after that, they moved me to Stalag Luf 1, and I was there until the end of the war. And that was my one and only real exciting experience in my life. But I managed to get through all right. Now, Peter uh, was lucky in a way. He was, as I told you, he was really beaten up, and Ma Mimi was beaten up. But they put him in the, in the jail in, um, in uh, Mepples City Jail. And um, on Christmas Day, I heard about this later. Christmas Day, the underground raided that jail, and they killed a couple of uh, uh, policemen who were probably, uh, um, I don't know what you call Dutchmen that are uh, working for the German. And they got Mimi and Peter out. And they got them out of town, and they recovered. And uh, when the Canadians came in to uh, eventually, and to overrun Meppel and other cities and get rid of the Germans. Peter was leading his underground group again. A fascinating man. And he, I found out he was just a couple years older than me. I am only 22, but <laughs> he, he was quite a guy. And um, well, anyway, after the war, uh, I came back and I went to the University of Michigan. I had started there and I just went back to finish it up. And interesting little thing, I, uh, I got a telegram from some of the Washington um, Army uh, headquarters, whatever, what you call it, saying to come to Washington because Peter Vandenhurk was coming over to receive a medal for his efforts and, and with the undergrounds and with the, you know, the uh, and leading the troops uh, in this cleaning up of Meppel. Yeah, this is wonderful. I'll see Peter. And this, the next day, I got another telegram says, forget it. Not, they didn't say that, but they said, they decided it was too much to offer one person. So they gave him his medal in, in, in uh, Holland, or not in Holland, in England. And I didn't get to see him after that, but at, at that time. Well, anyway, I've been back to Holland uh, four times, I guess. And I saw I, Peter, been, and I saw Peter, Peter came here. He told me about the uh, this group of um, uh, people who, like you know, the Escape Innovation Society. He was. He told me, "Why don't I join that? I had never heard of it, <laughs> and so I did." And now Peter, Mimi has died, and Peter is unable to walk too well anymore. So he hasn't been over here for some time. And. Uh, 
The other person that was captured with us was the, uh, uh, the young girl who was the courier. And uh, I'd seen her over in Holland too. But now she has Alzheimer's disease and uh, in, living in a nursing home. So that's how my, my people are that help me. And that's my story. Well, Howard, that was really great. I thank you so much for putting it on film for us. You're now part of history, AP's history, and uh, uh, you named names and did things. And uh, after it's uh, sort of over now, uh, yeah. anything else you want to add or thinking about? No, unless you want me to mention the fact that I got it all written down here. We'll do it. Show this it, is show just us a copy of your book. Okay, it's called Beyond the Dikes. It's it's not about my me. I wrote it for the Holland people. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's that story. This is I told you, just that story. Turn it up in front of you so we can get like a that. shot of it. And how would anyone order it? Well, it's in, in all the uh, um, bookstores. But it's like one of these you have to order and uh, and and then you then they send it to you. Yeah. Well, thank you. I bought one of your books and uh, well, I hope I'm you enjoy read it. it. You bet your sweet before I. See you next year in <laughs> Philadelphia. Okay. Philadelphia is going to be a lot nicer than here. It took me five extra hours to fly from Rochester to, to Wichita Falls. I had more plane trouble. Hey, don't mess with <laughs> Texas. It's not we've, Texas. We've had a good time here in Wichita Falls. Oh, I like that. <laughs> it's getting here.